Robo Advisors, where algorithms, allocates your savings according to your risk profile, has made investing easier than ever before. And of the five or so players licensed to operate in this country, are the largest is Stashaway, one of also the region's uh, early players. Which makes their journey really fascinating because their model, dreamed up some seven or eight years ago, has disrupted this once stuffy and complicated area. Hence, today's conversation with Michele Ferrario, uh, one of Stashaway's three co-founders, is fascinating because I will ask him, amongst other things, whether Stash can still make one's financial dreams come true, given the turmoil, turbulence in financial markets. As always, do please consider subscribing to the channel if you find value in the conversations I have with the people I speak to, including liking this video, um, telling me your thoughts in the comments below, and maybe even sharing it with other people who you think might find value in these interviews. And so now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, may I present Michele Ferrario, Stashery's CEO. Okay, Michele, thank you for doing this. Thank you for coming all the way from Singapore. Thank you for having me. Let's start with some congratulations, which I think are in order. You've passed, I think, a couple of years ago, a, a billion dollars in AUM across your, I think, five odd markets, right? Um, I, I want to ask you whether you thought this was within expectations in terms of penetration attraction in, in robo advisory. Yeah, so thank you, first of all. And as you can imagine, passing one billion US dollars is a gigantic milestone for a company that started from scratch. At the time, this was in January 2021, when we passed the one billion. We were only live in uh, uh, Singapore and Malaysia. So this was out of our two countries and has been definitely a great journey. It's actually been uh, faster than we originally planned and expected. Uh, but as you, as you can imagine, you can always want to go faster and want to grow more and want to serve more people and want to help more people. Uh, since then, we've grown quite a bit as well. We opened three new markets, uh, Thailand, Hong Kong and Dubai. And we continue to grow also in Singapore and Malaysia. So to be honest, quite happy. Uh, was a big milestone. We did celebrate internally. Uh, and you know, looking forward to the next big milestone, adding a zero to that number. Yeah, so I think the main issue, Michele, um, is, is for me, because I think the idea of robo-advisory is excellent. Uh, it, it's low cost, it's digital, it's, it's high liquidity, small, th small ticket sizes, easy in, easy out, right? I mean, that was the idea. And that, that's a big departure in a way. It's, it's quite an evolution of your typical unit trust uh, universe, right? Which is a little bit encumbersome and, and quite expensive, if I'm to be honest. The thing is, um, at what point in time, because I, I think the main competitor, as you've said on, 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 on broadcast media, is that your main competitor is, is the big cash market. A lot of people are still uh, quite risk averse and they don't want to put their money out of fixed deposits and cash, cash accounts. Um, and that's a big sum of money. I, th I think it's a, at least a few hundred billion uh, around Asia where, where you're based. Why do you think people are not moving from, from those accounts into robos? What's the psychological block there? Look, I think uh, you're right that in Asia, there is a percentage of cash uh, invest left not working that is very high. It's uh, you know, over 40% in most markets. In Malaysia, it's 42%. In Singapore, 37% of people's financial wealth. This compares to 14%, one four in the US. So it's much, much, much larger. And I think the reasons for that, there are multiple reasons for that. One is, uh, I think it's a failure of the financial services industry. The fact that in this region, the financial services industry has been uh, pushing products with high fees, making it difficult for people to understand because in transparency, unfortunately, helps traditional players to charge more fees and make more money forced people to be more conservative. There, is, there might be also a cultural reason. So maybe forever there will be a higher cash penetration here than there is in the US. And in some countries is also uh, driven by the fact that maybe the government has a bigger uh, uh, kind of helps people more with their retirement plans through you know CPF in Singapore, EPF in Malaysia, etc. more than the government would do in the US. But overall, I think the summary of it is that it's a failure of the financial services industry when you have so much money not working for people. This has been true for a long time. And I think that new players and players that want to uh, get better can really help people build wealth and retire earlier and reach what I call, you know, financial peace of mind earlier in their lives, simply helping people do the right thing. And the right thing is not take zero risk. The right thing is having a balanced approach to managing your money. Save well, but also once you've saved and you've done half of the job, there is a second half of the job, which is making that saving work for you in the long term. 
Yeah, so I think everybody at, at different stages of their lives have got different goals, right? So if you're like a 20, 25-year-old uh, fresh grad or you know just entered the workforce, you might want to be saving for your wedding, your, your, wedding, uh, your first car maybe, your first property, right? Yeah. And typically that capital um, uh, um, allocation is, is not present for most people because salaries are so low in this country, right? Wage growth is so, so slow. Eventually, and, and with the price of properties going the way they are, Sometimes you can't even afford to buy your own property, right? So how can you, is there a way to play the system with robo-advice? Because I think there's a lot of ways, right? You can actively manage your funds. You can, you know, you can um, um, DCA, right? Of course, right? What, what are the ways you can do that to, to reach those early goals? Look, uh, for early goals, which tends to be shorter term, because, you know, you want to buy a car in a few years, you don't want to spend 30 years yeah. to buy a car or, or to go on holidays or, or to buy you know, your, your first property. The rules are the same as for longer term goals, which is you want to, first of all, you want to make sure you're saving enough. So there is first a, a work you need to do on your monthly cash flow. You know, how much money comes in, how much money comes out. Is it more important for you to go out one more time for dinner or to buy the car in three years? And you need to make choices. You know, you can't have everything. But the second thing, once you've decided how much you're saving and you actually stick to that plan, then is to make sure that that money works for you. And given your timeline, you want to make sure that you're taking the appropriate level of risk. If you have a shorter timeline, you're going to take less risk. If you have a longer timeline, you're going to take more risk. Uh, and uh, how can you use a platform like StashAway to do so is by building a portfolio that is diversified so that you're not putting all of your ask, uh, eggs in one basket. Uh, and that is appropriate to your risk preference, given the timeline you have for that specific goal. Now, one thing that we did early on when we launched Stash Away, uh, and it's uh, still a kind of a main one of our core features of the platform, is that you can have multiple portfolios. So in my case, for instance, I, I have uh, all of my financial wealth is with Stash Away, but it's not one portfolio. I actually have several. Uh, and I have several for two reasons. One is that because depending on the timeline of these goals, I have different risk profiles. So for my retirement goal, which is long term, I have more risk. For my kids' university goal, you know, my oldest uh, kid is now 10, so it's starting to get closer. <laughs> uh, I have a bit less risk. Still, I still have a fairly, you know, uh, kind of a fairly good quantity of equities in there, but a bit less than what I have for my retirement plan. So that's the first reason. The second reason is that I like to earmark money for something. It, I like the fact that I have, you know, one, one of my portfolios called Matteo University Fund. Matteo is my son. And the other one is Agnese University Fund. And the other one is Luce University Fund. These are my three kids. And, and I think attaching a meaning to the money motivates me to make sure that those funds are, in fact, you know, continues to grow because I both I'm contributing on one side and secondly, you know, they're well managed. And I think that's a good way to put a goal, make sure that you know where your money is going and psychologically will help you stay on track. You know, what I find interesting, um, Michele, is that I, I think a lot of people realize that they've got to spend less and, and save more or invest more. But it's a, it's a mental thing because it's it's like a health, it's like, you know, your exercise, right? You know you got to work out, you know you got to eat less, you know you got to drink less sugar, eat less sugar. But then people don't have the discipline to do that. It's the same thing with investing, right? Yeah. Um, so you can put the platform there and you can let people use it. But sometimes they don't come to that journey much, much later on in life, typically in their 30s, right? So how do you address that? So I think uh, you need to recognize your biases and your weaknesses and try to use tools, systems to uh, kind of uh, force you out of those biases. You know, we are, you're talking about, you know, that if you exercise uh, frequently, you will actually get, you know, uh, more physically fit over time. A lot of people that can afford it, try, you know, have a personal trainer, not because they need the support, but because they know that if they have a meeting with a personal trainer that is very expensive, <laughs> they will go to the gym. That's the only way to do that. Now, I don't think that you need to get to that extent in investing, but I think having a disciplined plan, it's absolutely key to achieve results in the long term. And therefore, what you can do is one is uh, set up a dollar cost averaging system where you don't need to think about it every month, but rather you already have set up a direct debit, for instance, where you know that every month, uh, you're going to have, you know, 100 ringgit, 1,000 ringgit, 10,000 ringgit, 100,000 ringgit, whatever is your monthly contribution, going directly into your portfolios. And this is set up. You don't need to do anything. You do it. You review it once a year, once every two years, uh, depending on how your uh, you know, overall financials are moving. And, and this happens automatically. And this will avoid you every month thinking, oh, but now the markets are too expensive or they are too cheap 
or maybe I can spend a bit more next weekend. You don't have this conversation. You just you make that decision once a year, and then you're disciplined uh, for for the very longest time. Uh, this is to me is extremely important. Uh, obviously, uh, and this is, this enables you to invest again through the ups and downs in the market, which is very difficult, but the right thing to do. So um, you talked about retirement, right? And you know, um, I don't know if I can m mention your age, but um, <laughs> you can, you can. <laughs> <laughs> so you've, you've entered your fourth decade, right? Um, and a lot of people are grappling with the idea now of retirement. Um, I guess less so if you're younger, more so if you're older. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, I, I talked with Hisham of, of EPF, and it's, it's a very big big issue, right? Even the younger guys, they follow the fire movement, right? Uh, financial independence, right? Retire early, and then they want to fulfill their dreams and maybe not buy a house, maybe not even have a family, right? Um, how do you look at retirement? How, how do you plan your own retirement from a personal perspective? So what, what kind of, I think everybody's got a number, right? Yeah. So look, uh, uh, because so I'm Italian originally and I live in Singapore and I've been working in Italy, in the US and Singapore. So my kind of a public retirement support is de facto zero, meaning, you know, it's not that I've lived in a country where I've been contributing for every year for 20 years. To, uh, to my retirement plan. So I need to care about my retirement myself. I think everybody should think about it that way, even if you have EPF or you have CPF in Singapore or whatever other rep retirement plan you might have in your country. But in my case, it's, you know, it's the only, you know, my, the only retirement plan I have is mine. Uh, and so the way I think about it is one of my portfolios I mentioned earlier uh, that I have multiple portfolios stashed away is my, it's called a retirement plan. Mm -hmm. And I contribute to it monthly. Uh, I have, because I know it's far away in the future, I have, quite a bit, you know, at the higher risk. So I have a f kind of a full equity portfolio, de facto. How old do you want to be when you retire? So, it, look, I think in, in my case, I don't know what retirement really means. I Meaning I don't think there's going to be a time where I'm going to just stop doing everything. I think for me, it's going to be more when uh, instead of having one full time job where I spend, you know, 12 hours a day doing things, I will have multiple things and hopefully helping companies, you know, I'm building an experience that I think can be valuable to uh, younger people. And I don't know, you know, right now, to be honest, I'm fully focused on building Stash Away, so I don't have that timeline. But, uh, you know, I'm in terms of money, I'm thinking about it in, you know, I need that money in 20 years plus, right? You know, between now and 20 years from now, I'll, uh, I don't need that uh, retirement money, which means I can take equity risk without thinking about it twice. Uh, but again, I go, it goes back to the, what I said earlier is uh, discipline. So I, I keep investing through the ups and downs. You know, in March 2020, markets crashed. I kept investing. Uh, through 2022, markets slowly uh, went down throughout the years. I kept investing. And if you look at it now, those are the best investments I made because obviously I bought at lower prices. Uh, now that you know we are in uh, August 2023 and markets have rebounded a bit from the lows, uh, you know obviously the, there is a higher you know higher returns on those money. So I think that's there's no secret. It's not rocket science. It's a question of discipline, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah, I saw some of your earlier stories, and I think you mentioned that when you started Stash, I think seven years ago, or you hired well, I mean you you and Freddie Lim and and one, I can't remember Nino. One, Nino, right? So you are the kind of like entrepreneur business internet kind of guy. Freddie was more the investment kind of guy. And then the third guy, I think he's more processes, right? He's a tech guy. He's, he's a, a computer te he's, Yeah, he's, he's a tech guy, right? Um, the thing is, um, Stash, to some extent, is quite actively managed, right? In some respects. And there was a time, I think, a couple of years ago when you when you went big on China, right? Um, because it, it had come off so much, right? Pindodo and Alibaba and all these other guys, right? Yep. Um, and, and there was a bit of a dent in, in, in the portfolios, right? And I think a lot of people decided, hey, what's going on here? They lost a bit of faith in the platform, um, how would you address those issues when in terms of the active management side of things? Yeah, so let me maybe first clarify active and passive. Yeah. So we are very strong believer as a platform, and I am personally, in passive investing. Now, when people talk about active and passive, usually you're talking about security selection. You're talking about selecting whether to invest in Microsoft, Google, or Amazon at any given point in time. And that's what usually people talk about when they talk about investing is, oh, I've bought Amazon at X dollars and now it's up 20%. I bought Google at Y dollars and now it's up 30%, etc. That's usually what a discussion is because it's a sexier topic. It's a fun topic to have when you're drinking a beer with your friend. Unfortunately, numbers say that in the last two decades, security selection or the process of deciding whether to invest $100 in Google or $100 in Microsoft have been uh, not generating returns. 95% of professional investors, so people that are paid 
to make those choices, that's their job, actually underperform the index. So to give you an example, 95% of active managers in the United States uh, that are investing in kind of large companies underperform the S&P 500, which is their, their index of, of, of reference. So there's only one in 20 that does better than the index, which tells you that if you're not a professional investor, you know, imagine how high the odds are that you do better. That's why we believe in passive investing. We don't do uh, security selection. But that's only the second step to investing. The first step is deciding in which asset classes you want to put your money. If you have $100, you need to decide whether you want to put $10, $0, or $15 in North American equities. $0, $10, $15, $20 in gold. Uh, 10, uh, you know, 0, 10, 15 in, uh, you know, China uh, equities, etc., 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 in bonds, etc., etc., etc. That's asset allocation. That's where actually you make a difference. That's where a proper asset allocation over time will actually enable you to get higher returns and lower volatility, lower risk. Uh, so increase your risk adjusted returns. So that's the concept of Stash Away. We help you manage your asset allocation over time through the uh, different economic cycles. And that's what the large you know, endowments will do. That's what you know, your, uh, your Harvard endowment will do, the Stanford endowment will do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we try to bring that intelligence to everyone. Now, to the China tech um, uh, question. In uh, 2020, 2021, uh, actually 2019, 2019, 2020, 2021, uh, we had as part of our asset allocation, especially for uh, larger, for uh, more riskier equity portfolios, we had an allocation to China Tech as one of the uh, asset classes, and which did extremely well in 2019, 2020, and then uh, did poorly since uh, February, March 2021. Uh, and uh, once, uh, and when it did poorly because of a regulatory crackdown on yeah. china you know which is quite quite you know known at this point in time during uh, 2022 2021 uh as of now <clears throat> uh so in, and uh, you know a few months later we actually decided to uh exit the the, the the specific position uh and go to a market weight for china so right now we're actually you know the, our portfolio are market weight on china uh, and i think that was the right decision because actually china tech has continued to have to be extremely volatile and it's more or less uh, right, right now at the same price as when we exited the position two years ago. Yeah, so I think the issue is because um, you're still quite a young platform, right? And you're still trying to establish yourself in the market. Reputation, must, even though in Malaysia you're the biggest robo, right? Um, so so I guess f from your perspective, you've got to make the small, you've got the mistakes, you've got to make the mistakes as small as possible and to make to not make them material. But I think a lot of people did lose faith in the platform, which I think is unfortunate, right? Yeah, because absolutely. because big fund houses make these mistakes all the time, right? So so how do you make sure that you, you iron out the kinks over the long term? Look, in general, so maybe let me add one detail to this. So the way those asset allocation decisions are made are systematic. It's not that I wake up in the morning and I say, let's invest in gold or let's invest in North American equities or let's do that. We built a, a framework, a system, uh, again, to avoid human biases, a and that framework or system use data, microeconomic data, to make asset allocation decisions. The core logic is, if you are in a recession, uh, you will have higher performance from long-dated bonds, for instance, and therefore you want to have higher allocation to long-dated bonds and lower allocation to equities. If you are in good economic times, actually your equities will do better. So this is, and when inflation goes higher, uh, you need to uh, be careful with the long-dated bonds. You want to have a shorter duration and you know there are certain subsector in equities that will work better, et cetera, et cetera. Now that's the core logic and that's systematic in nature. Uh, the, the China tech example is something that uh, happened outside of the macroeconomic environment. It was a regulatory crackdown that you know, cannot be uh, you know, put in a, uh, uh, in, a frame, in a systematic framework this way. The way we continue to, uh, kind of, the way we think about things is that obviously we continue to, uh, to work on improving and making the, uh, the, the asset allocation system more and more sophisticated. Uh, and that's something we've done throughout the, you know, the period we've been live. And actually, when you look at our returns, we have overperformed uh, the markets in every year since we launched, except 2021. So we, we overperformed in 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2022, and 2023. And we have not, in so in six out of seven years, uh, we have overperformed same risk benchmarks. 
And the reason we have not overperformed in 2021 is the China tech uh, underperformance that you mentioned. Yeah, I, I find that interesting because I'm, I'm also, you know, uh, I need to make an, a, an admission. I am a client of Stash. Thank not, you. Not a lot, but a little bit. Just, you know, just on to see what's going on, right? Um, but how do you ascertain whether you bid a benchmark based on who? Or yeah, what, so what, we, right? we look at what we call the same, uh, same risk benchmark. So in practice, uh, and right now we actually have a broad variety of portfolios. So let me just, for the sake of keeping it simple, let me just explain what we do for our core portfolio, which is 12 portfolios we launched you know, six years ago. Uh, so these 12 portfolios have a uh, different level of risks from bond risk, kind of 100% bond risk to 100% equity risk and everything in between. Uh, for each of these portfolios, we look at the combination of MSCI equity world, so a broad equity index, global equity index, and FTSE global bond index, so a broad uh, bond uh, index, in a combination that produces the same volatility, so the same risk, over the last decade. So, for instance, if you take our Stashway risk, risk index 22%, uh, the volatility of that portfolio over the last 10 years would have been the same as a portfolio with 60% MSCI equity world and 40% FTSE global bond index. So 60% MSCI equity world, 40% global bond index is the benchmark for statutory risk index 22%, which is one of the 12 portfolios I mentioned. And that's a same risk portfolio. So you want to beat a portfolio that has the same risk and it's broad in nature. So we've overperformed this benchmark, as I mentioned, every year except for 2021. Yeah, so so that, that kind of makes sense. but. Um, I, I, for me, my, my account, right, and I speak from personal experience, I, I dialed up the risk all the way, <laughs> I think I'm 36% maximum risk, yes. right? But it hasn't done, it, it hasn't really moved in the way that I thought it was going to move, right? I think in the first one and a half years, it was really, did, did really well. And then in the subsequent couple of years. But so, so basically what I'm trying to say is that it doesn't give you the, the you know, you want a bit of the flutter, right? Yeah. Like absolutely. in the crypto markets. So you see, even though it drops 15, it can go up 17% next day. And then you feel that action, right? So for a younger guy who wants to have that action, right? You are asking a young guy to be patient. That's, that's tough, right? I agree. I agree. It's tough. And we yeah, go yeah. back to the discipline we talked <laughs> about earlier, right? So, of course, we are not a platform that promises to double your money tomorrow or next week or next month. We are helping you build your wealth in a sustainable way over time doing the right thing and uh, that means that most probably you're not going to make a hundred percent return this month but you probably if you if you uh, if you have a you know five ten fifteen years time horizon and depending on your risk level you're going to make anywhere between you know five and ten percent per annum which compounds and will give you very very high returns and when you're going to look back 10 15 20 years from now you're going to pat yourself in the shoulder because you're actually going to have really built wealth while obviously you can always go to the casino and gamble and if you get lucky you get more money and uh but you know if you do it many 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 times odds are that you're actually not going to make money over time you know that's how it works so address some concerns uh Michele. some some people might say oh i don't invest in this platform because you know i don't know whether they're going to be around in three years time five years time right I mean, even as you speak, some robots in Malaysia might be at risk of extinction, right? Yep. You're not going to name any names. Um, so, 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 for example, I might say, oh, I'm going to invest with Maybank because at least I know there's, there's the Maybank asset size behind me. They're not going to fail. I may not, I will not lose my money, right? How would you comfort people to say, oh, you know, um, Stash is, you know, Stash is not bank backed by JP Morgan or not backed by Maybank, right? Um, maybe they disappear next year or 10 years time. So how, how would you address that? Maybe two, two things I can say. The first one is uh, we are a you know, very solid company. We are live in five markets with licenses in five markets. We're regulated by the MES in Singapore, by the Securities Commission in do Malaysia. They, do the regulators require you to have a, a you know, like capital ratios like the, like in the banks to, yeah, of course. to make yeah. sure that the, the depositors' money are safe? Yes. So, of course, there are a lot of rules that we need to report on on a either monthly or quarterly basis, depending on the country, on capital uh, capital availability. We have minimum capital in every country. Uh, but let me talk about the risk in a second uh, compared to the banks, because it's very different. But anyway, what I was going to say is that we are very solid. We are regulated in five markets, you know, MES in Singapore, SEC in, uh, in Malaysia, and an equivalent in Thailand, Hong Kong, uh, and in Dubai. Uh, we are backed by blue chip investors, you know, Fidelity, one of the 
top three asset managers in the world is actually one of our shareholders as well as uh, sequoia capital which is one of the most respected venture capital in the world and uh and, you know in square and hamilton lane which is one of the largest private markets uh, um investors in the world at least in you know, on nasdaq managing uh, you know close to a trillion us dollars so uh, we are very solidly black we've been around for seven years we've grown a lot we keep growing we keep investing uh we are by far the largest player in malaysia uh and uh, and so i think in general we are extremely solid but let me talk about you know the uh what happens to clients what it should be uh, th so clients don't need to trust what i just said because the system the regulatory system is built in a way that protects clients irrespective of what happens to the platform so clients money is always separated from stash away's money and this is by regulation clients money is always with custodians so we work with ct and hsbc uh, as a custodian of our of all the assets of the clients and they are in segregated accounts that are not stash away accounts so if you look at our balance sheet you're not going to find clients money in our balance sheet so basically if, not if, ours. if someone has a hundred bucks with you that hundred bucks is stashed away well no no pun intended but it's stashed away somewhere is that right Correct. it's a custodian is a custodian structure which is by regulation ev you know every fund manager does this because this is what regulator uh regulars wants now why this is very different from the way you think about a bank. So, you know, some people ask me once in a while, why you do not have deposit insurance, which you have when you put money in a bank? And it's very simple. When you give $100 to a bank, the bank takes your $100, turn around and gives it to somebody else as a mortgage or as a loan. And therefore, there is a risk that if the mortgage is not repaid, the bank does not have the $100 to give it back to you. And if there is a, what is called a run on the bank, so a lot of clients want to withdraw at the same time, because the mortgage is long term, the bank cannot get the mortgage back and will not be able to give the money back and therefore goes bankrupt, which is why governments around the world have uh, established this thing called deposit insurance. So if the bank goes bust, the government will cover up to a certain limit. For fund managers, and we are a fund manager, that problem does not exist. If tomorrow all of our clients were to withdraw their money, it would not be an issue. We'll simply sell all of the ETFs and, uh, and the product we've invested in and give the money back to clients. Now, it would be a company issue, meaning we're not going to have any assets anymore to manage, but for the clients, it would not be an issue. The money will go back. So what I'm saying is two things. One is, uh, we, I mean, we're very solid. We've been around for a long time uh, and we're, we, we, we are building an institution, really. But you don't need to believe in that. The reality is that the regulation around... Uh, around fund management actually cover uh, the fact that there is no specific risk for you and it's built in a way that protects uh, clients' money. I mean, seven years in the robo world is a long time, but you know, not compared to like, say, I don't know, JP Morgan's 100 years, right? Yeah. But that's a long way to go. So I want to talk to you because you're a business guy, right? You're an entrepreneur kind of guy, right? And therefore you're not, you, it's, it's like what um, uh, Jeff Bezos talks about. He has discussions with his team about what's going to happen in five years' time, 10 years' time, one year's time, right? So I'm sure you have these similar meetings with your guys as well. Uh, and you would have seen what's happening with the, with the banks, um, the whole uh, existential threat to them. Like in America, you talk about the run on banks, yeah. you know, First Republic and all these other guys, right? Silicon Valley Bank, you know, long-dated bonds, short-dated bonds, and then there was a run on the banks, loss of belief. How does that all pan out? And, and how are you positioning some, something like yourself to deal with this future, where in, in future the banks might not exist? Uh, there may be different financial intermediaries in, in the fray, um, how, where, where do you see it all happening? How does that happen? How does it evolve? So I, uh, I, I believe that the banks will continue to exist at least as pipes uh, to, to the financial system. Now we can discuss forever whether the banks will also be the front end and the face to the clients, but they will exist as pipes to the system. And I think in some cases will also be a front end to the clients. So I don't think there is a, we're, we're living through an extinction of the banks. There's always going to be periods of time, times where some banks will, will struggle. And that's what happened in the U.S. earlier this year with some of the regional banks struggling because financial conditions tighten, because uh, 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 some of, you know, I think some of them, they, they just had, you know, some blatant mistakes on managing their, their balance sheet. And, uh, and some others were just, uh, you know, there was a contagion uh, that was, I have, to, I have to say, quite well managed by the Fed. In fact, uh, the contagion stopped quite quickly. Uh, but I don't think that we're, you know, running the risk of seeing all the banks uh, go bankrupt. I think it's important that everyone uh, thinks carefully about 
which banks to bank with and that's what we do as a company uh, because of course there is deposit insurance for banks but at the same time you want to make sure that who you're banking with is actually uh, is actually strong and uh, i think that's a responsibility of every individual and every company yeah i want to ask you what you thought because like what happened with american in the early part of this year right the, so the small you know kind of mid-sized regional banks some of them went under um, some of them are at risk of extinction. But the biggest beneficiaries are the big banks like JP Morgan and yep. Bank of America, right? They got all the, the lion's share of the depositors' funds fleeing from the small banks. So the big got bigger, the small got smaller, and some of them just went out of business, right? Yep. Um, what happens with, with players like yourself? I mean, for example, like now, I, I think the 10-year um, b- bond yield for the T-bill is something like 4.5%, which is crazy. It's n- never been high for the last, in in 20 years, Right. And that's crazy. So, so if you're looking for a return on your money, right? If you like, say, because five in, if you got a five percent return, you're gonna double your money in twenty years time. Okay. If you got a ten percent return, you're gonna double your money in 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 ten years time, right? That's how it works, right? So, the higher the return, at the least possible risk to meet your financial goals. So, with all these things happening with the Fed policy and interest rates going where they are. How how are the robo guys planning for investment returns? It's very it's very simple. So if we look at our offering in Malaysia, we have a cash management offering and an investment offering. So cash management, we call it stash away simple, allows people to invest in de facto short term treasuries uh, and uh, in in ringgit, so without uh, any currency exposure, uh, and allows people to benefit from the higher interest rate the environment where we are today. So I think stash rate simple is about 4% a year, Correct. right? Correct, correct. Okay. Uh, yeah. And obviously it moves a little bit with interest rates, but as of today, it's around 4%. And uh, and this is a and this is a good place to put your cash, to put your emergency funds and to manage, uh, to manage your, uh, again, your short-term cash needs. Now, on the investment side, when you look at the portfolios today, versus the portfolios a year and a half ago. I mentioned, we, talk, we talked earlier about asset allocation. So today, investing in short-term treasuries, which is in practice uh, in investing in the US government uh, bonds uh, short-term, is obviously much more appealing than it was two years ago. Two years ago, they were yielding 0%. Now they yield 5.4%. This is like a, you know, less than three months treasuries. And so when you look at our portfolios today, you'll see actually a significant part of the portfolios, depending obviously on the risk level, but a significant part of the portfolios leveraging this 5.4%. And this is the reason why I mentioned earlier, a dynamic asset allocation strategy that changes asset allocation over time as conditions in the marketplace change is so important. Two years ago, investing in US short-term treasuries didn't make any sense. Today, it makes a lot of sense as part of a portfolio. Depending on your risk level, you might want to have more or less. Uh, and this is, you know, gives opportunities to asset allocators. And uh, so I think actually the current uh, bonds environment is an interesting one to, uh, to, to be because it gives more opportunity than two years ago, if you will. So to me, that's quite interesting because it sounds like you're quite dynamic in terms of reflecting where the market is, right? So are you saying, and the other thing for me, is, which is interesting, is with your typical fixed deposit in, in the bank, you've got to lock it in, right? For the one year or the 10 yes. years or the three years, three, three months or whatever. And then if you redeem it early, you lose all your interest, right? So the, the liquidity element in, in, in your platform is interesting to me. Um, um, why is it that you can do this and, and Bank Nagara allows it? Whereas, the, So in a, in a way, they are shooting themselves in the foot, right? No, we are simply investing in uh, different types of, uh, of instruments. So as you mentioned, all, all of our products uh, available in Malaysia are uh, fully liquid. So that's way simple is, you know, uh, it takes a so couple I can of days. put in today and I can yeah. redeem in two yeah, weeks' you, time. You, yeah, you can you actually you can withdraw just, in a couple of days. So yeah. you just click withdraw, you know, it's three clicks and you get the money in two days. And the same for our investment products. Now, our recommendation for the investment products is to have long term investments. But if for whatever reason you want to withdraw, you can withdraw at any time. Why is that possible? Because we invest in liquid instruments. It's very simple. We invest in liquid instruments we uh, and we, we pay a lot of attention, uh, a lot of attention to that. So, so that that liquidity is interesting, and you can take part in those um, you know money market uh, instruments right now, which are really really interesting from that perspective because of the Fed interest rate policy. I, I want to ask you about your customer profile, right? Because um, it it sounds to me like this is something that is catered to the younger guys, right? Digital, low cost, small ticket size, um, liquid, right? But then, but then you've also got a high net worth. So, so what are your customer profiles, and what kind of things do they look for? Look, our core. Uh, group of clients are 30 to 45 years old, uh, people working professional jobs, making decent salaries, being able to save money, and, and uh, 
being at an age where you start thinking about your money a bit more seriously. Maybe you're getting married, maybe you're having kids, and so you start thinking about your responsibility toward others, not just your responsibility toward yourself. Now, so that's the core. That's where most of the assets come from. We also have actually a very significant group of people below 30 that have started investing with us. In terms of number of people, is quite significant. It's around half our client base, but obviously their contribution in terms of assets is smaller, uh, just because, as you can imagine, you know, on average, people that are 25 years old are, uh, have less money than people that are 40 years old, as you can imagine. Uh, and But we are very happy to have those people as clients because those are the ones that are starting to reap the benefits of compounding early on, and we are happy to help them do that over the next one, two, three decades as they build their wealth over time. We also have a group of clients, and initially that surprised me, a group of clients across ages uh, that are wealthy. So people that have you know more than $2 million US dollars in financial wealth. And initially I was a bit surprised, uh, but then I realized that if you have less than 10, 15 million US dollars in financial wealth, the current financial services system, so the banks, actually treat you quite poorly. If you go to a private bank with 5 million US dollars, you are actually not treated particularly well. You are a bit of a problem. In fact, some banks don't even accept you. Uh, and if they do, they will give you a junior RM and, they will, uh, and un unfortunately in order to pay his salary or her salary, he will need to sell you expensive products. And so we saw a lot of clients coming from um, kind of, you know, from higher segments, uh, especially financially educated clients that understand the value of keeping the fees lower. Uh, you know, let's remember that our fees go down to 0.2% per annum when you have more than 3 million ringgit. So it becomes extremely attractive. And people that understand the value of diversification, people maybe that they, they got burned before by trying to bet on stocks because they're a bit older, perhaps. And so we actually see that as, a, as an interesting segment of people that are, you know, not a lot in terms of number of people, but obviously quite relevant in terms of uh, assets. 0.2% a year, that's, um, that's still a little bit higher than the ETF that BlackRock and, you know, Vanguard's funds charge, right? So, I mean, of course, you're performing a service. That's, 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 that kind of makes sense. Uh, that includes custody and brokerage. Eh? So yeah, when you buy yeah. an ETF, you need to pay for custody and brokerage to someone. Right, right. So, you know, you cannot just uh, buy an ETF uh, with nothing. So 0.2% per annum, including everything, is actually, I don't think you can find anywhere in the world anything lower than that. So it's it, to me, this is like a like an EPF alternative because in Malaysia, you've got a private retirement scheme, which I don't think is doing that great, right? Then you got your EPF, and then other than that, you don't really have much choice other than if you're Muslim, you might have ASN or, or Tabong Haji, right? Um, but then for the rest of the world, um, you can't have your um, parallel universe to EPF with with Stash, and that kind of makes sense. So 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 what kind of like things are you doing for this for this segment of the market where they do want to retire early, they want to have a bit of pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, right? Um, but they don't quite know what to do. What what how can you get to them? So we believe that the more clients understand the basics of investments, the more they will actually like what we do. So they control the investments, they're the one who actively manage it in a little bit because they, they can allocate accordingly? So the platform offers a variety of ways to manage that yeah. money. Uh, uh, what I was going to say is we invest a lot of time and effort in education, financial education. And the reason we do that is that the more people understand the basics of investments and the logic of what actually bears fruits over time in investing, the more they will gravitate to a solution like ours and rather not buy unit trust with crazy high entry fees or invest insurance uh, link, uh, sorry, investment link policies with incredibly long lockups and low returns because those are products that are that have incredibly high fees built in, very low sophistication of investments and just don't work over time. So the more people understand the more they will gravitate towards stash away as an option, which is why one of the reasons why we invest so much in education. To answer your second question, we do offer a variety of tools in in the platform. Either, you know, if you want to completely offload because you don't know anything about investment, you don't want to know anything about investments and you want to completely offload, Stashway helps you with that. In a few clicks, you can build a very diversified portfolio that is professionally managed. But if you say, look, I actually have a perspective on the asset allocation I want, and you know, I don't want any exposure to China. I want more gold or I want less gold, etc. We have something called flexible portfolios, which allows you to actually tweak the portfolios or build the portfolios from scratch. We do have a few clients that say, look, I, I like the infrastructure that you built. I like 
the recommendations that you give I like the insights that you give but I want to have the last say in building the portfolios because I'm an expert and therefore we we provide a tool that actually allows people to do that while still controlling the risk so is there room for crypto and in, in what you got what you want to do uh, I know you're not licensed for crypto but um, yeah. is there room for that consideration down the line so a couple of uh, so let me maybe make a step back uh, when people ask me should I have crypto investments my answer is I think having single digit part of your financial wealth so one two three uh, percent of your financial wealth invested in crypto if you believe in it I don't see why not worst case scenario you lost one two three percent of your wealth that you know you're still gonna survive uh, good case scenario you know that one two three percent becomes 10 20 30 or whatever that might be if crypto goes to the to the roof and so you who, do, you and do, who you knows do, you do believe there's a possibility of that uh yeah i i, I don't know so it's very difficult to be analytical about it uh you it's uh i think what happened over the last two years uh tells me that at least parts of the cryptocurrencies uh universe is probably here to stay i mean if the second largest brokerage uh, in the world goes bust with a scandal and you know uh, you know if you look at the prices of cryptocurrencies after that happened uh, they didn't go to zero they actually you know stayed at a, at a decent level it tells me that maybe there is some at this point broad credibility that sustain uh, the price in a certain way having said that i'm i don't know i'm not uh, you know, I don't think anybody knows, and particularly I, I'm not. It's not a focus of my activity. You know, I believe in. You know, I, we focus more on the remaining 98% of your money rather than in this 2%. So, yeah. uh, where you want to have a bit more diversification and prof, uh, kind of a in asset classes that uh, have been uh, providing returns for the last uh, 100, 100 years or so. Having said that, in in Singapore, we do offer for high, for high net worth individuals access to crypto. Is exactly following this logic. So it's one click. To add up to five percent of your portfolios uh, to a crypto exposure, but we only offer in Singapore as of now, and only for accredited investors. So, what do you buy with that? If if you have that kind of like uh, customer, is it is it? Are you buying grayscale? Are you buying? We are buying. Uh, Bitcoin we are buying or? Bitcoin and Ethereum 50 50 uh, through. So you buying directly the the coins. No, we are buying two ETFs that are uh, uh, real asset backed. So actually, ETFs that invest in the real coin. Which one is that? Uh, Canadian one, uh, uh, Canadian trade ETFs, because in the uh, in the US you don't have. Um, um, you don't have direct investment; they're only future-based, which we don't we want to avoid. Uh, one is the purpose uh, Bitcoin. I don't remember the Ethereum one, the, the manufacturer. Okay, um, just want to get your thoughts on this because one of the reasons why the Bitcoin market was so tough this year was the um, downfall of FTX. So of course, FTX at the time it was supposed to be the darling, right? Um, beautiful exchange, Sam Bankman-Fried. You yeah. know, he was the blue-eyed boy. And then it went, and then it emerged that they were actually dealing with um, customer funds, right? They were actually taking money from people and sort of allocating the coins. And they, they, maybe they did, and then they maybe they're leveraging that to go and buy some other stuff. Was it Solana? I can't remember what it was, yeah. right? Um, can that fear be be kind of like right across to what you guys are doing? And how do you address that, right? I would say quite the opposite. I think uh, unfortunately, what happened is uh, proof that working with uh, regulated institutions like Stash Away is provides a level of security and comfort that you cannot have if you're just uh, working So there must be with, proof of the custodian's accounts and yeah, the I money mean, we had, aside, right? You know, the level of scrutiny that uh, a fund manager like Stash Away operating in Malaysia uh, or in Singapore or in any other country receives is from the regulator is extremely high. And so working with uh, regulated legal entities, I think it's a, it's a must when you're putting your, your money at work. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, the crypto industry for i don't want to generalize but you know the ftx case was a case of honestly inc incredible <laughs> recklessness incredible, which was yeah. possible only because they were operating outside of the system uh to be honest if somebody had written a book uh, about it a few years ago you probably would have said oh this is not credible and actually it happened in real life so do you think that what gary gensler in america is trying to do uh, in terms of regulating the industry and you know he's putting these brakes on the on the whole industry, right? He SEC, right? American, right? Do you think what he's doing is correct in terms of, you know, what the, their objectives are, whatever they may be? Look, I don't have a perspective on how. Uh, I'm not an expert in you know financial regulation in the U.S. and uh, uh, and I'm not a deep expert on crypto. I understand you know the, the basic logic, but I'm not a, a deep expert. So I. I'm not the most qualified person to give a perspective. I think that in order to you need to strike the right balance between making 
the cryptocurrency environment possible for for individuals to uh, to invest safely uh, while at the same time enabling innovation to happen it's a fine line so if you regulate too yeah. hard you're gonna make it easier for people to get comfortable with uh, investing perhaps uh, but you're gonna potentially constrain innovation if you don't regulate enough then you favor innovation but then you you, you create risks and so walking that fine line is not easy I am that's not what I do as a, as a job, and I'm happy I'm not doing that. Um, uh, so I, I understand. If you look at around the globe, different regulators have taken different paths, and uh, we'll see what happens. I think it's still early early days in in seeing how that how how that uh, plays out over time. So I think you told me earlier that um, you know 100% of your financial wealth, your savings, lah, basically, are in your own platform, right? Yes. Um, I'm sure that they can be audited, so maybe they'll check one day, somebody, see how much money you've got inside there. But the, the other part of your wealth is, of course, your interest in Stash, right? And for, for you, it, it's, so we'll talk about entrepreneurship now, right? Yes. Um, for, for, so obviously for you and your investors, you want to have some kind of liquidity event, right? For them to cash out and maybe, you know, realize their, their faith in you and, and, and your platform, right? Um, how do you read the internet market in, in Southeast Asia right now? Because it's been quite tough the last two years, three years, you know, the Bukha La Paz of this world, the, you know, the Travelocas of this world, yeah. they've had a really hard time. Grab, suffering, right? Um, what, are, what are your views in terms of the nascence of the Southeast Asian internet market? Yeah, so maybe uh, two, two things. First of all, uh, in terms of, you know, thinking about building the company, you know, we yeah. are fully focused on continuous building yeah. and, you know, I'm not thinking about, you know, uh, liquidity. And I don't think that you need to think about it. I think uh, there are ways, you know, we're trying to build an institution, and as you build an institution, you know, shareholder structure might change over time, but that doesn't mean that anything changes at the company. And so that's that's the goal and that's what we're trying to do. With what concern the internet... Sorry, wait. Stash, so so building an institution, what does that mean? What is the definition of an institution? Institution is... Is it a market cap? No. Is institution it, is to it me a, is, a, is, a, um, uh, is a platform or a service provider, a company that survives whoever is involved survives the ceo survives the shareholder survives so you know you uh, you know you were mentioning earlier some of the uh, oldest name banks you know the oldest name banks have changed over the so last so you want to be 50. one of those in 50 years time yeah i mean i, Maybe, I would like yeah. i would like yeah. i would like uh, stash away to be you know a, a name as uh, you know as renowned as uh, maybank in malaysia or a city bank in the us you know it's a uh, stand you know uh, a company that stands on its own brand, on its own history, on its own culture, and uh, and is not depending on a few a few single a few individual people. I think we're you know we made strides ahead in that direction, and I think uh, we have an opportunity to really build an institution. Now, to your second question on the internet uh, industry in Southeast Asia, I've been in the region doing internet uh, for 11 years because also of my previous job, so that's why I came to the region. So I've seen the development of it. When I came in 2012. Uh, there was no venture capital, there were no entrepreneurs, and de facto there were no real companies. There were only very few, you know, maybe Property Guru was the the one kind of larger tech company that was already in existence. And then, uh, you know, Rocket Internet came and, you know, built the Lazada, Zalora, Food Panda, and then a few others, you know, then Grab came along a few years later, etc. So I've seen the development. And I think, we, you know, in the last decade, things have developed incredibly, uh, incredibly well. There will always be ups and downs in uh, in any industry development, and obviously the 2022 uh, public markets uh, route had an impact on private markets as well, and that's why some of the company you mentioned, you know, some of the large companies have been struggling, particularly the one that were publicly listed because they actually uh, they were actually the most affected, you know, unprofitable publicly listed company were the ones that were the most affected last year. Affected last year. Does that? change the fact that technology is uh, changing people's life on a daily basis in the region, improving many, many, many people's lives and therefore building value for a number of stakeholders, I don't think it does. If you think about your daily life and how many different new companies you deal with on a daily basis that, you know, five years ago, seven years ago, you didn't deal with, uh, it's quite impressive, you know, you, you, you came here, maybe you used a grab, uh, and so you did it with your phone, and then maybe for dinner tonight you don't want to cook and you're going to use Food Panda, and for your investment you're using Stashaway, uh, and these are all things that you are 
uh, that you're doing with your with your phone that you know you couldn't do five years ago seven years ago eight years ago and so there is real value that is being created in the economy and some of its value some of it will be uh, will continue to be built and then as it's normal some companies will thrive and some others will suffer and that's normal but I think that there is real value being created yeah unprofitable internet companies so those those are the ones at risk right um, I, can, I can think one of the most outstanding examples is maybe uh, C Limited from Singapore right Forest Lee's company right yeah. uh, Shopee and you know yeah. a couple other things right the thing is I think a lot of people don't realise that Amazon back in the early 2000s they had many, 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 many years of unprofitability, yes. but the market was very patient with them. Maybe that patience doesn't exist today. Um, and look, I, there was one time people were saying, will Amazon go out of business? Because they were just so at risk every single quarter. They were just losing yes. shed, shed, shed loads of money every quarter, right? Yeah, but I think the sto history is repeating itself. If you look at Amazon, if you look at what yeah. was said about the company during the 2001 bubble burst, yeah. so... Uh, yeah. It was very similar to what has been said in 2022 about some of the publicly listed uh, tech companies. So uh, is it a time and, to buy it? <laughs> and, no, and, no, no, and I'm not saying that because it depends. It depends on the company, which is why, as an investor, I don't pick names. I invest in sectors because I think the sector will thrive. The specific company, I don't know. It's very, very difficult to tell you whether company A or company B uh, will actually make it you know at, at what size over time but it's very easy to tell you that technology has been changing the lives of all of us and will continue to do so and so value is being created and so i want to invest in the sector not betting on a single company and obviously today is easy to say oh you know amazon was obviously the winner but it was not true in 1999 it, yeah. it was not obvious you, yeah it was not obvious in 1999 that amazon would be the winner ebay but, was much bigger at the time yeah. i think or you, yahoo was, better, yeah, was yahoo. bigger than google and uh you know and uh, except, so there is many many examples that when you take a picture back in the days they were not obvious and then things just play out in a way uh, over time there was a netflix is another good example you know there was a, a time where everybody thought okay blockbuster will kill them yeah didn't really happen actually yeah. kind of the opposite and uh and you know now last year people will say disney will kill them let's see if that's gonna happen or not i just don't know so just buy the basket like, don't buy the stock right yes i mean that would be the common sense way yes. let's talk about co-founder selection okay because the situation with co-founder selection and how old you are and how much experience you got behind you it's also fundamental. Yes. Uh, some some months ago, I spoke to Nipun Mera of Ula, the Indonesian yes. unicorn, right? And he had worked through, I think, five or seven companies, all quite blue chip companies. And he, he came to the job with a lot of experience already and he knew what he wanted and not wanted, right? So for you, you came as CEO of Zalora. You spent some years on Rocket, right? And then uh, I think Freddie Lim came from, I think, Numura, head of derivatives, right? Then I think, um, you know, yeah, came from... He built with several companies. He's a Correct. tech entrepreneur. Correct. Yeah, so we are more or less all the same age in the early 40s right now. Yeah, yeah. So different skill sets, some experience, certain age. I think you're 37 or so at the time, 35. Yeah, 35, yeah. Yeah. So what, what can you advise people in terms of not just co-founder selection, but how old you are when you want to come out? I don't think there is a rule. I think it depends a little bit from who you are, how you think, how you do things, uh, and, uh, you know, and what you want to do as well. Yeah? In my personal case, I don't think I can, I could have done Stashway or any other companies by myself. Why? For two reasons. One is that because the way I think is through picking other people's brain, sharing my perspectives, hearing back, getting feedback. So that's the way I think. I think by talking and, and listening. Uh, and so, you know, you cannot talk and listen by yourself in front of a mirror. And so as a solo founder, I think I would be a failure. Uh, so that's the first reason. The second reason is that I wanted to build a digital investment platform. And while I have a background in uh, investment and I have experience building tech companies, I'm not a tech guy, like I'm not a computer scientist, and I'm also not a professional investor. Like I, you know, I, I, I did work in the financial industry before. I was a private equity investor. I, was, I advised banks when I was at McKinsey, but I, w I was never managing you know, billions of dollars in assets. And so my perspective was I need to, to work with people that bring to the table real experience in those two areas. And so I met first Nino, our CTO. Uh, he has built several companies before. He's a computer scientist by training. He had at the time, you know, now has two decades of experience building companies. He definitely knows what he's doing. And, and I needed that. I would have not been able to build Stash Away without a partner like Nino. And then, and then a couple of weeks later, uh, I met with Freddie. 
uh, Freddy has been our chief investment officer uh, until very recently. Now he stepped in a less operational role, but you know, has been instrumental in building the company to where it is today. And he came with two decades of experience in managing billions of dollars in assets. And so he had done this before at the highest possible level. And Nomura at Lehman Brothers and Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley. So at the highest possible level. And I think that helped, you know, that made Stash Away possible. We were, as you mentioned, you know, in our late 30s at the time, all of the three of us now we're all in, the, in our 40s. Uh, and therefore, we all had, you know, anywhere between, uh, you know, 15 and 20 years of experience in doing something specific. And we had, we brought to the table different capabilities, which I think is one of the reasons why it worked out well. I also uh, have been doing angel investing in uh, kind of a, in my, in my capacity uh, as a, on the side. And uh, one thing that I realized is that co-founding team of people that are very similar uh, are the more difficult to manage over time because if you if you have two people coming from the same background they will naturally over time step on each other's toes unless they are really brothers like they really 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 can work together uh, it becomes difficult so my preference is for teams to actually bring to the table different characteristics and different uh, kind of a different skill set and therefore taking different responsibilities which is what we did you know Nino has been the CTO since the beginning Fred has been the chief investment officer since the beginning and I've been the CEO kind of uh, managing the remaining uh, the remaining portions of the building of the company and then you need the chemistry right because Absolutely. what if he doesn't like your face right yeah. but you, you, you do you know what I mean there's very, there's very there's something that a lot of people don't realize right oh yeah you spend you got to like each other oh right? yeah you spend 12 14 hours a day for many many years Arguing together and yeah and, least, and you're not always going to uh, have the same perspective like you will have points where you disagree which is very healthy yeah you need to make sure so the way i think about it is that you need to build a team where the disagreements are always about a topic and never personal. So what, if we disagree about the color of this table, we can talk about it. We can get a third, uh, third perspective. We can look at it better. We can uh, you know, paint, repaint it if we want to. But, you know, there are things that we can do together until a certain point, maybe we reach an agreement, or until a certain point, one or the two says, OK, I disagree, but let's go with your perspective, and I'll back you. Hmm? If the disagreement becomes personal and I say, oh, no, you just you know, your eyes don't work well. <laughs> uh, you know, you're not no, seeing no. the colors right. Yeah, yeah. Then it becomes more challenging. And so that's, to me, the key is how do you build an environment? And this is true at a co-founders level, but it's true at, a, at every level in the company. How you build an environment where people can disagree, but disagree about a topic. They find ways to solve the disagreement. They have a disagree but commit type of uh, approach where even the people that at the end of the game do not agree with the final decision, they will back the decision and try to make it successful. And that's cultural. It's, uh, you know, so, so to mitigate the possibility of you know quarrels down the line, maybe in old days you could just operate on gut feel, right? Oh, I, th I think he's a nice guy. I think I can work with him. Okay, you want to start a business together, right? But then nowadays you've got all these tests, right? To 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 test your mm. personality types and whether you're compatible. The bell bin, for example, you know, are you the green? Are you the red? Are you the yellow? Are you the mixture? We, we, you know, compatibility. Do, would you go down that path, or do you recommend people go down that path? I don't know. Look, I'll tell you what I did. You know, uh, with uh, Nino and Freddie, it was in my so I, I had this idea, and first I met Nino, and then I met Freddie, and uh, in both cases, I I was trying to understand two things. One is, do they know really, 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 really well at work class level the topic? that they need to bring to the table. So in the case of Nino, building a tech infrastructure than the tech company, and in the case of Freddie, uh, managing assets, you know, investing. And, uh, and, and how you get to the answer there is in two ways. One is you look at what they've done. Two is maybe you talk to people that have worked with them before. Uh, and three, you know, if you know a little bit about the topic, you can kind of probe a little bit and go into the details. And I know a little bit about both topics, so I could actually have this conversation. But the second part is, Will I enjoy spending 12, 14 hours a day in the same small room with them? Yes or no? And I don't think you can do tests around it. I think that's also how you decide whether to marry a person or not. Right? So you, you don't you don't do a test. Uh, I mean, maybe some, maybe some, pe some people do, yeah, but you know, you you, try, you spend some time together and you see how things go, and uh, and you and uh, there is a little bit of gut feel. I think the older you are, the easier it is because probably you met more people. And so you know yourself better 
you know what you can live with, what you cannot live with, what you appreciate, what you do not appreciate. And so I think the older you are, the easier this process, the more natural this process is. In my case, with both Nina and Freddie, it was fairly clear after a few coffee chats that uh, I really would enjoy spending time with them. You know, we, had, we, we share common values, even if we come from different places. You know, I'm Italian, Nina's German, Freddie's Malaysian. Uh, but, you know, we've all been global citizens. We've all worked in a variety. You know, I worked in the U.S., Nina's worked in Russia, in the U.S., Fred has worked in Japan and, uh, and, and lived in Australia. So we've all been very global. We all shared a number of perspectives, a number of values. And I think that, you know, and then very importantly, I was extremely lucky. You know, just yeah. Nina and Freddie are two amazing guys. And I was just extremely lucky that maybe that's the bottom line, maybe. What is your opinion of luck? Um, you know, I think it was uh, Gary Player, the South African golfer. He said, the harder I work, the, the luckier I get, right? But there's also no arguing with the fact that um, market, ti- market timing, market dynamics. I think the, fa- the fact that you've got a, a, a digital investment platform right now kind of come at a better time because, you know, because of the problems in the existing conventional system, right? Yep. Maybe 20 years ago, forget it, right? It will not have happened. How many percent... Um, would you ascribe luck to in terms of importance? Uh, luck is extremely important. I agree that the harder you, you work, the luckier you get. I would agree with that. So it's very diff- that's why it's difficult to tell you how much is luck and how much is the hard work, right? Because the yeah. two things are, in a way, interconnected. Yeah. Uh, the reality is that in a long, you know, building a company takes a long time, and there's going to be times where you're going to be lucky and times where you're going to be unlucky. Uh, I think at the end of the game, it's going to even out. And uh, and therefore, what remains is your hard work. People. Um, people are the most important thing, especially with internet companies, right? Uh, I want to get your opinion in terms of hiring right, because I think you mentioned before, you better make sure you think three, four, five, t- six times about hiring the right person, because if you, if you get it wrong, it's a big problem, right? Yeah. How much, how important is paper to you? Degrees and, you know, certificates and all that versus, you know, the other side, I mean, because there's this whole idea now that universities and tertiary degrees are declining in importance, especially in, in, in comparison to how much you pay for them. To me, uh, degrees and papers are a shortcut to judge out of things. So degrees by themselves are totally irrelevant. What is relevant is, given the job you're trying to hire for, does the person you're talking to have the right uh, brain power, the right attitude, and depending on the job the right experience and in some jobs the experience might be more important some other jobs might be less important uh, uh, but you know the first two brain power and um, attitude are always important for any job now does the degree tells me something about either your brain power or your experience maybe you know if you went to this top university and you graduated top um, top grades from the top university maybe tells me something about your brain power. If you are, if you have this uh, degree, you know you're a CFA. Uh, maybe that tells me something about your understanding of financial markets. Uh, but that's not enough. You know that's just a shortcut to judge something. It's not some. You know it's not a, a per se the reason why you would hire a person. And most importantly, it tells you nothing about attitude. So to me, which is to me extremely important and maybe uh, i wouldn't say the most important of the three but definitely a conditio sine qua non so if you don't have the right attitude i'm not going to hire you period what amounts to a right attitude what amounts to to a right attitude yeah so that depends on the culture of the company in my personal perspective attitude means you need to be uh somebody that wants to learn somebody that uh, appreciates and understands other people's perspectives somebody that uh cares about the output of your work so uh, you own your stuff so there is an ownership feeling uh somebody that is easy to deal with that where you can dis- the example of disagreement i gave you earlier somebody that you can disagree with without making it personal uh and then the you know, attitude will change you know depending on the culture of the uh, of the company you're hiring for in my case you know in, uh, in the stashway case and my personal preferences you know kind of the, the things i mentioned are the most important ones uh, but obviously, different companies will have different culture and therefore look for different attitudes. What are the highest paid roles in Stash and how are you hiring for them? I mean, it goes with seniority, right? So the C-suite, so people at the uh, C-suite level are obviously the highest, higher paid jobs. Sorry, in which, sorry, in which skill sets? Which, which areas, uh, departments? It, it goes across, you know. Yeah. Uh, is it technology? Is it investment? No, it goes across, it goes across functions and then for the rest, we, 
we try to look at uh, market you know we we are you know um, uh, market sensitive to, uh, to to what the right salaries are we try to make sure that we are uh, very competitive on on the salary side we do offer stock options to every employee uh, from day zero uh, if you are a full-time except interns uh, and that's true irrespective of whether you are just out of university or you are joining as a c-suite member so yeah. we have so a, you know, yeah we, so the, the liquidity event comes into play right at some point in time there's going to be some kind of exit right um when you, but when you know, you, liquidity can happen in different ways. Correct, in in correct. 2021, we actually gave some liquidity to uh, stock option holders as part of a fundraising round. Yeah, yeah. So it right. doesn't need to be a sale. So we did, right. a, we did a fundraising round and we, uh, we gave the opportunity to people that wanted to uh, get some cash to, yeah. uh, to sell some of their stock options. In fact, I know, uh, I know, you know there's obviously quite, not a lot, but a few people that took, uh, took advantage because of maybe some personal situation. There was one yeah, guy that was right. buying a house and so that was a good way to kind of get the down payment and reduce the mortgage. Uh, you know, and so there are different ways to actually make the stock options financially interesting for people over time. Yeah. Um, okay, I won't take up to make too much more of your time, but um, just want to ask you about the difference in dealing with uh, Sequoia and Fidelity. I mean, these are tier one kind of investors, right? Yes. Versus your tier two and tier three. When you deal with the tier one investors, I mean, first, first of all, how do you attract players like that and how do you manage them in terms of expectations? So uh, how do you attract great investors is by building a great company. <laughs> so I think that they want to invest in great companies. and uh, So what is a great company? A great company is a company that uh, has very large potential. So they look obviously at the future. They're investing in the future. Uh, that has financial size, right? Financial uh, value. Yeah, over time. Okay. Yeah, of course. Okay. They, you know, these are investors, right? So they're trying to make sure that they invest in companies that will get big and profitable over time. Uh, a great company is a company that leads its. Uh, so the leader in a specific sector, in our case, you know, we're the leading uh, digital wealth management company in the region. Uh, a great company is obviously a company that sh where the ma management seems to be able to go through the ups and downs that are natural in any building of a company. And so uh, I, I think they look at people quite, quite in depth. And different investors will have different angles and they will look at different things in different ways. Uh, but, you know, uh, at the end of the game, they're betting on, uh, uh, they're trying to understand how, big can this company get does the current team is the current team able to build that and manage the complexity that that entails uh and are you know uh, are they you know have, have they proven in the past that they can do they can make the right choices and then uh, you know and then obviously they also if you have first you know tier investors like you know sequoia square peg fidelity that we have in our cap table uh they will also help you do that right so they will be strong supporters because they have seen how great businesses are built, and so there will be a strong support. Yeah, um, you know, in the past, right, fund management was a, was a part of uh, banking, right? Uh, the universal bank model, right? In the future, and in, in your read of the market, do you are you acquiree or acquirer? Um, I don't know what that means. Meaning that we are. Do you get bought out by a big banking group, for example, if, if that were to, to pass? Or were you to, or were you would you come to the size where you buy the bank because maybe a digital bank who who knows right? As I mentioned earlier, we are I mean, building an institution, right? So we are focused on continue building, and we're focused on uh, continue providing uh, kind of a, you know expanding our range of offering to for our clients, uh, listening to what the demands are. We don't. We, I'm not focused on uh, you know what the banks are doing or uh, what we could do with them. Uh, we are also not looking at buying banks uh, as of now, mm, but you know, obviously, uh, strategic decisions uh, can change over time, and uh, you know, I, I don't know how, how things are going to play out in the next decade or so. But definitely, the, our goal is to continue building uh, and building an independent institution. Okay, let's end with your advice uh, about financial literacy, because I think it's very important. It affects everybody, right, young and old. What? Um what nuggets of wisdom can you pass on to people in terms of building financial literacy? So building financial literacy, I mean, you need to, uh, so we're talking about learning and education. So uh, what you need to do is understand the basics and try to make sure that you understand the basics uh, in, a, uh, in a way that is not biased by whoever is giving you those basics. So uh, understanding the basics of financial planning, understanding the basics of investment. You don't need to be 
not everyone needs to be an expert you don't need to do uh, to to learn everything but because unfortunately you need to deal with people that might sell to you products you need to be able to understand broadly speaking whether the core core principles of investing are respected or not as part of that product that is being sold to you one kind of tool that we built for clients is uh, Stashway Academy. These are free videos available on our app. These are non-commercial. We're not trying to uh, to pitch Stashway, but they actually are, I think, a great starting point for people that want to understand a bit more. Now, then, if, you, if during that process you also get excited about markets and investing, and then obviously then you start reading more about it and you just, you know, slowly learn more and more and more, but you don't need to. It's not that everyone in the world needs to be uh, Warren Buffett. I think that everybody in the world should have a core basic understanding of investing. In fact, I think it should be taught in high school, uh, but it's not. And so you need to do it yourself. I completely agree with that. Um, I think too many people outsource too many important things in their life, right? Their retirement, uh, their children's care, for example, right? Yes. Um, their own personal development, too many things, their health, for example, right? You know, this is fantastic. Thank you for coming over. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. and. Good luck with Stash, man. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you.